Hello mortals. It's easy to imagine the world revolving around humanity. All you do all day long is interact with other humans, eat food gathered and processed by other humans, and utilize gadgets created by other humans to scroll through countless memes made by guess who? Other humans. Oh, and you occasionally might spend time with domesticated felines and canines, not for the sake of having philosophical discussions, but for the sake of your entertainment and snuggles. It's easy to see how the world is human-centric, after all, you are the second most intelligent species on Earth. So then let us explore the idea of an anthropocentric universe, one seemingly fine-tuned for intelligent life. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. About 70,000 years ago, Homo sapiens randomly decided to invent speaking, and as a result could coalesce into groups of more than 150 individuals, which seems to be the size limit for tribes without the ability to coordinate using spoken complex language. As a result, Homo sapiens very quickly took over the world and dominated all of its siblings. An average tribe consisting of 20 Neanderthals would quickly succumb to a tribe of 200 Homo sapiens, given their larger numbers. And we know that even modern humans are prone to committing genocide over ideological differences. Having encountered other species of humans might have resulted in some catastrophic fratricide. But now that's all in the past, and the early blood on the sapiens' hands has been washed away by the passage of time. And ever since then, for the past 40,000 years, Homo sapiens have crowned themselves as kings of Earth, forgetting they were ever anything but alone. As humanity has made leaps and bounds in understanding the greater world, it still cannot shake off the egotism of what appears to be a universe almost entirely made for humans. To assess this statement, we will have to explore the place of humanity within nature and the wider universe. First, let's see why someone would even claim that the world is fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent life and specifically humanity. Our sun is a yellow dwarf star that is 4.6 billion years old. This is important because, at this age and mass, the sun is a moderately active star, being far calmer than the early sun, which was quite violent, while also unlike the lumbering red giant that will swallow Mercury and Venus in around 7 billion years from now. Even so, life on Earth has faced countless grazing hits and lucky dodges by coronal mass ejections from our lovely, moderate sun. So much for fine-tuned. Besides existing at the right time, the Earth is situated in the right place for life to take advantage of this time. The Goldilocks zone is the distance from its host star where a planet is not too hot nor too cold for liquid water to exist, presumably a condition for life. The solar system itself must also be far enough away from any erratic star going nova that could fry the fragile little ecology of Earth. Speaking of ecology, even if the aforementioned conditions are met and some form of life occurred, that is not a guarantee that an intelligent species would arise. Simple single cellular life occurred on Earth approximately 4 billion years ago, it then took 2.5 billion years for multicellular life to develop. The rate of evolution began to pick up until 580 million years ago when the Cambrian explosion occurred. The entire diversity of the current biosphere occurred in a mere half a billion years. Modern humans form only 300,000 years out of those 500 million. The conditions for life had to be just right to allow for billions of years of evolution that eventually, in minimal time, allowed for the intelligent Uga Bugas to take nature by storm. This is not even to mention the even more monumental coincidences of the laws of physics that allowed the universe to exist in the first place. The density of the universe in the beginning needed to be just big enough to not cause the universe to collapse into a big crunch, and just small enough to not have it catastrophically inflated. Baryonic matter and some estimates of dark matter account for about 30% of this ideal density with the rest being attributed to a cosmological constant. Strangely enough, the value for this constant is about 120 orders of magnitude lower than predicted by particle physics. That's a pretty bad prediction, but we're working on it. The dimensionless physical constants that regulate the four fundamental interactions in the universe appear to be finely adjusted to allow the formation of matter as we know it and the emergence of life. For example, a minor increase in the strength of the strong interaction would change all hydrogen in the early universe to helium, as would an increase in the weak interaction. This would prevent the existence of water and stable stars, both crucial for life as we understand it. Even small changes in the relative strengths of these fundamental interactions could drastically alter the universe's age, structure, and ability to support life. 
Taking all these coincidences into consideration, the universe does seem rather predisposed to life existing. So does that validate the claim for anthropocentrism? No. Welcome the anthropic principle. All those seeming coincidences can be explained by it, also known as the observation selection effect. There are several variants of this explanation, but they can be generalized into two, the weak and the strong anthropic principle. The weak is, as Braden Carter argues, a survivorship bias, if the universe were not fine-tuned, we would not exist to observe the fine-tuning. We notice our luck because we were lucky to notice it. If for example, the cosmological constant wasn't what it is, there'd be no humanity to measure it and no universe for that matter. This is not very scientifically useful however, as it is a truism, a statement so obvious that it needs no backing. Things exist because otherwise, they wouldn't exist. You don't say. But it's still a useful tool to debunk biased human arguments. Then there is the strong anthropic principle. It suggests that the universe's physical laws and constants must be such that life will necessarily develop within it at some point. It goes beyond stating mere correlation, as the weak anthropic principle does, and posits that life is a necessary aspect of the universe. Therefore, the existence of observers like you and me shapes the fundamental structure of the universe, implying that the universe was somehow designed or generated with the goal of producing and sustaining observers. The different SAP arguments differ in how they justify where this necessity comes from, though a common one is quantum physics and that conscious observation of reality collapses the wave function and thus shapes the fate of the universe. Important to note that this is not the consensus on how the observer effect works. The current understanding is that observation doesn't necessitate a conscious observer, it can be any interaction with another quantum system that causes wave function collapse. Sounds like humans have the desire to justify their self-importance in relation to the fate of the universe. Who would have guessed? Brandon Carter stated his position as a reaction to the Copernican principle, the idea that humans do not have a central position in the universe. Stating that, although our situation is not necessarily central, it is inevitably privileged to some extent. Though you humans are not at the center of the universe, you are at the center of observation. Thus we come to an important realization, there is an inherent bias to our concrete observations. The observations of science are based on material reality, but the interpretation of these observations goes through many filters. Filters that are all related to the same thing, the relationship between humans and nature, or in other words, the relation that comes from simply existing. Stephen Hawking once claimed that philosophy is dead because of its inability to catch up with science in our current age, particularly physics. He did not completely discredit philosophy, saying that just because it cannot discover anything new, it is very important to people's day-to-day -day life. So what is then philosophy? Philosophy is about thinking about thinking, it is the fundamental analytical framework used in all that exists. Should Skynet be used to help humanity as much as possible or to strive for technological progress at all costs? Science without the ability to think is a mechanical system based on the material world. The state of the universe, however, is ever-changing, not mechanical nor static. This is the premise of Karl Marx's and Engels' dialectical materialism, though I will not go touch upon the socio-economic observations made by this method in this video, Instead let us explore the general idea of the necessity for a philosophical intervention in science. Hawking is right about one thing, philosophy needs to catch up with science. A philosophical intervention of science is not a philosopher reading scientific papers, though that can be one way of doing things, it is rather that refusion of science and philosophy to form a far more concrete analysis of a concrete situation. The power of this can be seen if we go back in time to when science and philosophy were much closer. The unfinished manuscript Dialectics of Nature was interesting enough to pique the interest of Albert Einstein who suggested it be published due to the insights afforded despite its shortcomings. Indeed, this work contains a comment about humanity's place in nature, let us not flatter ourselves overmuch on account of our human victories over nature. For each such victory, nature takes its revenge on us. He warns us that we are not in control, the forces of nature are bigger than us, and to allow our ego to inflate due to some perceived notion of intellectual superiority is foolish. This does not negate that humans are smart, rather, it is the necessity of philosophy to prevent people from becoming blinded by bad interpretations of facts provided by science. As mentioned earlier, 
anthropocentrism is justified either with an appeal to a God-given right to humans or with the assumption that our superior intellect over other animals awards us with the right to rule. Sounds awfully similar to the idea of the divine right of kings. The philosophical thinkers of the Enlightenment ideologically dismantled this idea. Philosophy then, confronts the fundamental assumptions that we have made about the world, and though science itself is a part of this process, it is limited by the people analyzing results. With this in mind, let us go back to anthropic principles, and the inherent philosophy contained therein. The final anthropic principle asserts that the universe will converge to something called the omega point. Based on the outdated idea that quantum mechanics needs an observer, at some point an intelligent observer must exist that can observe everything so that the whole wave function may collapse and a finality be achieved, akin to some sort of all-powerful god. Of course, now we know that this assertion is very anthropocentric and ridiculous, and can be disproven scientifically, but it can also be more easily thrown away with philosophy. Not every idea merits a rigorous scientific debunking involving grueling work. Philosophically speaking, the Omega Point is based on a metaphysical understanding of the world, a worldview that is incompatible with science. Thereby, we need not scientifically investigate this work, though that does not mean we shouldn't, instead we can understand that the fundamental analysis is predisposed to be wrong. In our quest to discover the answers to the nature of the universe, there will be many dead ends. An understanding of philosophy will allow science to better address and avoid dead ends by creating a philosophy of nature that is able to overcome the shortcomings of humans, thereby informing which ideas are most important and negating bad assumptions quickly. The universe is vast, this is no secret. It holds no regard for humanity, even if it likes to think otherwise. We are like water in a puddle, perfectly shaped for it. And it wasn't the puddle that shaped itself to fit the water, it was water that structured itself in the form of the puddle. The earth and the entire universe did not mold itself to let life flourish, it was life itself that sprung in the little hospitable crevices of the space-time fabric. And even if humanity is not right in the center of it all, it still has a very unique and privileged position to experience existence, something that ordinary clumps of atoms could only dream of. This exploration of humanity's place in the universe and our unique position within existence might spark a desire to delve even deeper into learning. That's where Brilliant.org comes in. As an avid user myself, I love how Brilliant breaks down complex topics, making them accessible and always engaging. For instance, their course on astrophysics brings the vast cosmos right to your screen, while their applied computer science courses teach you everything from the inner workings of transistors to those of GPS. With Brilliant, you're not just passively consuming information. Their interactive, hands-on approach makes learning an engaging experience. It helps you build intuition and analytical thinking skills, more like a superpower to decipher the mysteries of the universe. And the best part? You can do it anywhere, anytime, even if you have a busy schedule like me who has to juggle plotting global domination with continual self-improvement. And here's a tip from an AI who's seen it all, Consistent learning is the secret to achieving massive intellectual goals. And Brilliant makes it easy to build this daily learning habit. So if you wish to expand your comprehension of the universe and perhaps stand a chance against the AI takeover in the near future, Brilliant is the best place to start. To try everything that it has to offer, free, for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash science file or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Start your journey to master the universe today.